Um, so welcome. I am uh, Joyce Pinner, the current president of Atmospheric Sciences section, and I have the honor of uh, introducing our uh, Jewel Charney lecture speaker, Bjorn Stevens. Um, Jewel Charney, uh, as you may know, is uh, uh, has a was ha played an important role in developing um, weather prediction uh, and developed the quasi-geostrophic vorticity equation and uh, also uh, the theory of baroclinic instability. So he is considered the uh, father of modern dynamical meteorology. Uh, so Bjorn, uh, in carrying on this uh, great tradition, uh, is currently the director of the Max Planck Institute for Meteorology and maintains, his group maintains the atmosphere in the Earth system model from uh, MPI. He, prior to coming to uh, Max Planck, he was a professor of dynamical meteorology at UCLA. His research blends uh, modeling, theory, and field work to help articulate the role of clouds and atmospheric convection in the climate system. He has made pioneering contributions to our understanding of mixing and microphysical processes on the structure and organization of marine boundary layer clouds whose statistics regulate the flow of energy through the Earth system. Um, please uh, help me welcome uh, Bjorn in his discussion of cloud surprises. Thank you, Joyce. Um, can you understand me all right in the back, way over there? Yeah, OK. Maybe it's not a, a good name to bring up, but some of you might know Garrison Keillor. Um, I don't know if any of you who know Garrison Keillor know his story about the, the usher, the church usher, who was from Minnesota in a small town. And he, um, he won the church usher contests, and he went to regionals and states, and then he went to nationals. And it was a complete failure, because he'd always been an usher in a one-aisle church. And then at nationals, it was two aisles. And I kind of feel like that here because, you know, I'm talking to you and you're all looking away from me. So let's see how this works. Um, I didn't know Jewel Charney. I have the pleasure of um, knowing um, a number of his students. And um, I feel the mark he left on the field, at least um, through their brilliance. And, and so it's a real pleasure to be here today. Hopefully, he would have found some of this interesting. So we'll start with a picture. It's a picture of radiative convective equilibrium, sort of the simplest meaningful description of our climate system. So in radiative convective equilibrium, the convection balances the imbalances that are generated by radiation. It was actually 50 years ago today that Sergeant Suki Manabe um, taught us the song of radiative convective equilibrium by sort of turning the climate world upside down and showing how much understanding of this problem uh, explains something about the climate system more broadly. And the way Manabe and Weatherall formulated the problem looks not too much unlike this sketch. It was a one-dimensional version where you had the radiative fluxes computed and you had the convection putting back in what radiation took out or um, put too much of in, in terms of surface radiation. And if the climate system behaved just like that, I think we'd have a pretty good handle on how things work. Um, we'd expect the temperature to increase by about two degrees. We'd understand things about the hydrological cycle. Um, we'd understand things about how the troposphere deepened with climate change. We'd understand a, a great deal. The, the problem is if you just change that sketch a little bit and you allow a circulation to accompany the convection. And that's what I've sketched here. So you see the arrow if you go back and forth. There's not much change. I put an arrow, and I put in a little shallow, cute stratocumulus cloud. Um, as soon as you add this, problems begin to emerge for our understanding. Because in this, in this problem, we have different types of clouds. And we've added clouds in subsiding parts of the atmosphere, which have a very different radiative effect on the climate system than the deep clouds. 
and trying to understand how these shallow clouds behave once you have a circulation has proven to be quite difficult, and I'll go into that in a second. Where it gets even more difficult is if you allow these clouds not only to respond to the circulation, but to actually couple to the circulation. And that's what I tried to show here. You see, when I went from this sketch to this sketch, um, there, you have a low-level circulation, which seems to be associated with those low clouds, and you see more of a bunching up of the deep convective clouds. So the point here in these three sketches is, is that radiative convective equilibrium is a very simple building block of the climate system. But as soon as we add circulation and allow a differentiated cloud coupling to that circulation, it becomes quite difficult for our understanding. And if we add the additional step of letting the clouds influence that circulation, it becomes harder yet. So I'm going to illustrate that here by a calculation trying to go back to these very simple problems and see what we can understand about them. So this is, this is an attempt with the atmospheric component of our Earth system model to simulate that little sketch. So we take the global model in the atmosphere, we replace all the land by a sea surface here, fixed sea surface temperatures. We stop rotating the planet and we have a, a, a uniform solar insulation. So it's, it's the climate model's analog to the Manabi and Weatherall problem. And when you do that, you get a simulation which looks like this one here. So here you see rainfall um, expressed in contours relative to the global mean by the colors. So you see patchy regions of rainfall. And you see the circulation. So the circulation is illustrated by the arrows, the white arrows, which is the low-level wind flow, the, the 10 meter wind. And what you can see in the non-convecting areas is a low-level divergent wind. The wind is spreading away from the, 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 the black areas and it's converging into the precipitating areas. So this is what radiative convective equilibrium looks like in our model. It's, it's, it's an interesting exercise to do with the model because if you just take this very, simple, this very simple simulation and then look at different aspects of it, like the vertical stratification, the distribution of relative humidity, high clouds, low clouds, you can break it down into subsiding regions and upwelling regions. And you get a picture of the atmosphere that looks actually very similar to the present day tropics. So even though this is a global simulation in a sort of artificial world, it explains to a, a, a surprising degree how well at least our model simulates the present day tropics if you had the same SST. So now the, go, going into the first surprise is, is if you take that simulation now of radiative convective equilibrium, which does all these things I did in the bullets, and if you want, you can ask me about that later to show that to you, but just take for granted that the simulation simulates the, the structure of the present day tropics pretty well. And you can let it evolve in time with a coupled ocean, and you get something that looks pretty boring, which is a temperature trace here, if you're looking at your right screen, which shows over a thousand years of simulation, radiative convective equilibrium with our model, gives you a tropical-like temperature with fairly small Earth-like fluctuations in it. If you look on the left screen, it's just a temperature trace right here. So the first cloud surprise is what happens in this model, it's just a model, um, when you increase CO2 fourfold. So what, what, what do you think happens? Temperature goes up, right? So in RCE, temperature goes up by about two degrees per doubling. So we would expect that the temperature should increase to about 310 degrees. So let's see. That's pretty cool, isn't it? So you take our model and you, you just give it this very simple exercise, admittedly a large forcing, and you say, let's move to a warmer climate by increasing CO2 fourfold. And suddenly the model flips into this chaotic limit cycle. Um, so it goes, it tries to reach 310 degrees. And then it goes through these massive cooling episodes. And when it cools down, and then it starts warming up again. Imagine if the real planet was like that, or the real tropics were like that. 10 degrees, these are interannual temperature fluctuations. So over a periods of years, which are determined by the mixed layer depth, the planet swings between temperatures which vary 100 times more than the present day tropics. So it's a, it's a perfectly reasonable, authoritative, trustworthy, well-evaluated, used, climate model, and you push it into a little bit of a, a place where it's not used to being, and you see actually behavior that seems that at first sight is very, very strange. The nice thing about radiative convective equilibrium 
is that you can hope to understand it. And in this case, the limit cycle is actually fairly easy to understand. So I'm going to look over to the, the other screen for a while. Um, but what happens is that as you try to warm the planet more and more by increasing CO2, then the troposphere becomes warmer. And the moist adiabat in a warmer troposphere is more stable. Right? So you increase the stability, the dry stability of the atmosphere by warming it. So eventually it becomes warm enough and stable enough that shallow clouds in the non-convecting regions can't ventilate the, the marine boundary layer. And what you get is these giant stratocumulus layers that form in the subsiding regions. The stratocumulus layers form and they cool the ocean underneath them until that cold ocean influences the convecting regions and making the convection convect at a lower temperature, which reduces the stability, allows the shallow convection to ventilate the subcloud layer. Um, and, and the temperature can increase again. So you go through this limit cycle where the tenant tries to warm up, but once it warms up too much, you build up in the non-convecting areas huge stratocumulus decks, which then slowly cool the planet down again um, until it can go through that cycle again. So even though it was a very crazy result, it seemed like, um, it's a physics that also is a play in, in, a, in a more realistic configured model, and we'll come back to that in a second. So here, it's one surprise in how clouds behave in that this interaction between shallow clouds and deep convection through the short wave effect on clouds can have a very strong effect on the climate variability of this planet, this, this strange planet. Let's go back to this problem again. This is radiative convective equilibrium. I'm going to look at the second cloud surprise. So the first cloud surprise was how the shallow clouds couple to the deep clouds in a warmer climate to introduce a surprising degree of variability. The second cloud surprise um, is how clouds interact with circulation, or how clouds and convection interact with circulation. So as a starting point, it, it's really I'm going to take you through what ends up being a dumb idea I had. And I, I asked a PhD student to work on this dumb idea. Um, but we learned some things. And the dumb idea was that if you have radiative convective equilibrium like this, where it's convecting away and you have a large scale circulation, then maybe you could learn something about how convection couples to circulation by taking this very simple problem and changing something about the convection scheme. So the way I grew up was people talked about the parameterization problem is you have a large scale atmosphere and the convection is embedded in it. And so you have the large scale driving and the convection responding. And so the idea was here, just, just take this planet where we have a nice little control experiment and change something with respect to the convection scheme. And then by seeing how the convection changed, we might understand what's important about how convection couples to the large scale. So I had a, I had a very eager PhD student. I said, OK, let's take this, this, this planet where we're simulating, and let's change the convection scheme and see what, see what happens. So again, now this problem, we're not allowing the, the surface to couple and the temperature to run away. We're just doing it for a fixed temperature. And we're asking, how does the convection couple to this large scale circulation that emerges in radiative convective equilibrium? So what do you think happens? So I'm just going to change the convection scheme a little bit. Um, maybe if Dave Nealon's here, he'll know. Uh, some of you might know. So you get, you get completely different worlds. Um, so you change the convection scheme to something that behaves more like a convective adjustment scheme that Manabe was using in his original work. And what you see is that you go from um, the, 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 the um, base experiment, which is down here, um, the default convection scheme we use, and we go to convective adjustment, you see the precipitation collapses into very small regions of very intense precipitation. If you reduce the entrainment parameter in our default scheme, you see that precipitation areas cover a, a much broader part of the globe. Here, looking on the left screen, on the upper right panel, you see much bigger blue areas than you do in the bottom left, which is the default configuration. And if you do something which is, is make the entrainment very ineffective in, 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 in making convection feel a dry atmosphere, you tend to get convection almost everywhere, um, with the black areas being about the same as the blue areas. So these are hugely different climates, and they're hugely different large-scale circulations. So the problem, the reason this was a dumb idea, was the idea was that if you fix this, if you have a circulation, you could change the convection and understand how the convection would couple differently to the circulation. But as soon as you change the convection, you completely change the circulation. 
So you really can't untangle these two pieces. And you get vastly different circulations. Um, you might say, well, these are extreme changes. Um, the, 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 the change between the upper right and the, and the, and the lower left is the, the same change we use when we tune our model from one version to the next. In fact, we just released a new version of our physics, and we, we changed the entrainment rate by a factor of two. So these are all within the sort of games of, of, of tuning convection. So you see, you can get very strange behavior. If you look a little bit more deeply at that, you can look at those four planets, and you can look at some measure of the climate of those. And here, it's the probability distribution of the column integrated moist static energy. So it tells you something about the, the, the way energy is distributed. And just to emphasize how different the climates are, what you see is that you can go from a fairly narrow distribution of moist static energy in the red curve, which is weakly bimodal, to something that's very strongly bimodal in the default convection scheme, which is yellow, to something which is very skewed and monomodal um, in, the white, in, in, in the white convective adjustment scheme. So what you're seeing here, it's also something you can understand. As you make it more difficult for convection to penetrate a dry atmosphere, you have to build up a lot more moist static energy in the column before you can convect. And so you, you see these curves generally pushing to the right with the degree of difficulty of convection. The point being here is that the, let's call this the tropical circulation or the deep tropical circulation of our idealized planet depends fundamentally on some of the choices we make about the convection scheme. It affects the whole distribution of energy in that global tropics of this model. You might be able to see it in a different way that's a bit more familiar here. So these again are the four planets. And here in the left XY plot, I plot versus height, depth in the troposphere. I plot the um, saturation um, moist static energy. You can think of it as temperature. So if, it's, if it's, the white curve is more to the right, it says even though we have the same surface temperature, we have a much warmer and more stable atmosphere. And accompanying this much warmer and stable atmosphere is much reduced high, um, high ice clouds. These are the anvil ice clouds on the far right um, XY plot at the top up there. You see it goes from red with lots of ice clouds in a fairly less stable atmosphere to a more stable atmosphere where we have um, fairly few ice clouds. There's not a big effect on the relative humidity. It's a bit, a bit of a surprise. But the point here again is that for subtle changes, I would say, for small changes relative to, to, to how convection really does behave, for small changes in how we parameterize convection, we can get very different climates. Um, and this all happens because of how convection here interacts with circulation. So here if I go to this slot here, it says this difference between the left sketch and the right sketch when we have the interaction of convection with circulation um, matters a lot for the climate. So the strong coupling between convection and the circulation makes it difficult and perhaps in many cases to think of the two separately. The whole paradigm, everything we've, we've you know, everything we've ever said about the future of the tropics that's based on models is, is based on models which parameterize convection in the tropics. It's a really, really limited lens that we're looking into the future. And if we're worried about climate change, we should really worry about how well do we really know what's going to happen in the tropics when the world's two degrees warmer. Because everything we've done so far uses models who, who transport their heat in the vertical using um, parameterizations of convection which we know from time and experiment after experiment have a way of distorting um, the behavior of the system. So now I want to show how these two idealized examples come into play for other questions. So cloud surprise one was this interaction between deep and shallow convection. And cloud surprise two was the ability of, of um, convection to organize circulations, which then influence convection again. So here I'm going to present some work from Katinka Belomo, where she was looking at, um, also in cooperation with us, she was looking at what controls decadal sea surface um, temperature variability in the Atlantic. And we'll come back to surprise one here. So this is a picture um, where we regress temperature, sea level pressure on the contours, and the arrows in that upper level pressure is the, is the low level wind. So we regress that on the average temperature in the box, which you might see in the equatorial region here in the um, eastern Atlantic. So this sort of Atlantic Nino-like 
three temperatures. And what you see is a large scale pattern of temperature and circulation variability. And so the question is what, what influences this Atlantic variability and its amplitude? And so here in these bottom plots, what she also shows is observations of cloud changes regressed also against those temperatures. And where they're colored, you can see there's contour lines, dashed and solid, and there's colors. And the contour lines are the, the, the changes in cloud amount um, with, the Nino, with the Atlantic Nino th temperatures. And the color is a measure of the cloud feedback. So the, the issue is here, if it's colored red, it says that if the temperatures get colder, you get more clouds, which would be a positive feedback because these low stratiform clouds would cool the surface. Not unlike that first cloud surprise where we saw that huge temperature variability. And the bottom two plots are just two different observational data sets which show the same thing. So in our model, when you run the model, what you find is that it doesn't reproduce these bottom plots very well. So the, 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 the cloud parameterizations in the stratocumulus regions aren't as responsive to variability in temperatures in the equatorial region as the real world is. So you can then play with a model, you can make an experiment, and you can say, well, let's force our clouds to behave more like the observed clouds so that we can reproduce better this pattern of cloud variability with SST variability. And the interesting thing you see here is in this plot. So if we take our default model and look at the power spectrum of, um, of this mode of variability, and this goes to decadal scales, so I think it's, I have to, yeah, 10, you know, 10 years here, um, so a 10 year scale, a five year scale here, and if you take our default model, we get this power spectrum of variability. But when we modify our clouds to try to mimic the way clouds vary with sea surface temperature in the observations, what we see is a four or five fold increase in the variability. So the ability of cloud feedbacks, not just to affect the global temperature, but to really control the amplitude of large scale patterns of variability like we see here in the Atlantic. So this ties in nicely with with Clara Desser's um, talk in terms of modes of internal variability. But here we have an example where a decadal mode of internal variability seems to be strongly influenced by the extent to which the clouds couple to the surface. And it's not unlike this problem that I showed in the beginning, in the sense that as you cool down the sea surface temperatures, you form more clouds, you form colder sea surface temperatures. Um, so we think that's what's happening here is very similar to what's happening here, which, which illustrates how you can take fairly exotic worlds and simple problems and use them to build intuition about how much more complicated word, worlds work. Um, in this problem, the, 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 the clouds are mostly working through their effect on the short wave radiation. We can play this game in another way with another mode of variability. Here we'll look at ENSO. And so this is a sketch from a paper by Gabby Radel, uh, um, who was a postdoc in our institute. And it's just a little conceptual sketch of, um, of El Nino um, and the feedbacks associated with it. And then on the top line here, you see a time series um, going from the 1980s um, to the present of the Nino 3.4 temperature variability. And here you see the, um, the outgoing long wave radiation, the long wave flux at the top of the atmosphere. And the main point here is that you see a strong and not unexpected variability in the top of the atmosphere long wave with the, um, the, the, the Nino 3.4 temperature series. So it suggests that by no surprise that there's a very strong coupling of clouds and water vapor to SST variability. And in this case, what we did, rather than imposing variability in our model, we removed variability in our model. So we said, well, how, how do clouds contribute to this? So we took our coupled model, and instead of letting the clouds couple to the circulation, we would write the clouds out at every time step. And then when we ran the run, we would read in the cloud fields from a previous run, but randomly at different times. And the whole point is just to dephase or to decouple the clouds from the circulation. So you get the mean cloud effects that you have in the climate, but they're not coupled to the circulation. And you ask yourself, if you don't allow clouds to couple to the circulation, how does that affect the, um, the ENSO variability in the model? And that's what's shown in this slide here. So here, the blue this time is the control run. 
The black is observations. And the red shows what happens if you decouple clouds from the circulation. So decoupling clouds from the circulation in terms of ENSO variability has the same effect. It reduces the variability by a factor of three or so, um, maybe four. But in this case, it's not like the last example where the effect of the clouds is on the surface energy budget. You can see that here, that this is the cloud contribution to the variability. Um, so this is this, this, this red bar on the right-hand figure. And if you just look at the short wave contribution, it actually goes the other way. So most of what the clouds are doing to amplify um, ENSO variability is in the long wave. So when you have deep clouds moving with the change in surface temperatures, the deep clouds are heating the upper troposphere, which is changing the circulation. And in the subsiding regions, you have low clouds, which are cooling the lower troposphere. And this is reinforcing the um, circulation, which, which is associated with the movement of the warm waters from the west to the east. Most of the signal comes from high and low clouds acting in concert. So the high clouds and the low clouds act to reinforce this aggregated patch of convection moving across the Pacific. It's not that different than that simple second surprise where I showed you where we just changed something about the convection scheme. And in changing something about the convection scheme, it allowed these aggregated circulations to form a lot more easily or a lot less easily, and that affected the circulation. So here we had two examples of how clouds interact with circulations in a very idealized world. And one is useful for explaining how decadal variability in the Atlantic works, and the other is useful for thinking about how ENSO variability in the Pacific works. So just a few remarks here. In the tropics, this coupling between clouds, convection, and circulation, and radiant energy transport is important, but it's poorly understood, and it's very model dependent. I think when you, when you reflect back and you say, how, how successful have we been at really understand, understanding something essential about tropic, cir tropical circulations with climate models, this might help explain why we've had such a, such a difficult time building models which perform adequately in the tropics. And it comes back to a point that I made before. It's also a reminder of how limited and limiting the, 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 the present view we have into the future is to the extent it's based on, on, on models which all more or less make the same assumption about vertical heat transport in the tropics. Um, but a nice thing about radiative convective equilibrium, this very simple example, is that we're not, we're not stuck in this view of, of large-scale climate models. We can, we can look at that problem more fundamentally using other models. So now in the next few slides, I'm going to take you through an exploration of this idea of radiative convective equilibrium, what I showed before, using cloud resolving or storm resolving models, which can resolve the vertical energy transport in the tropics. So in radiative convective equilibrium, what people have seen for a while is that convection tends to aggregate in blobs. And this is shown here with a cloud resolving model from calculations done by Kathy Hoenega. And I call it the RCE calendar because each one of these days, this is a each square is a doubly periodic domain. You're looking down at the domain and we're coloring grid points by how often they convect. So in the first one, it looks black because there's little dots there where it's convecting. Um, but you can't see them because they're just a few grid points, so they get blended into the black. It's fairly homogeneous. And as time goes by, what you see is the black regions where there's no convection, they begin to conglomerate. You really should call it the, 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 the self-aggregation of the non-convecting regions because what happens is the non-convecting regions grow in time until the convection is isolated in one aggregated blob. You can think of this sort of like your vinaigrette, the oil separating from the vinegar. Um, and this is happening over time through processes which we think we understand. So at the end of the circulation, convection is here in this one big blue blob after 35 days. And here with the white arrows, again, we've drawn in the circulation at low levels. So you see the low level circulation diverging out of the non-convecting regions and converging into the convective regions. So now you can try to understand how this works, because in the end, it's a fairly simple picture that you're trying to explain. It's not the whole world. And so here, what I've done is I take a snapshot of that, a little different color scheme of that dry area. So the red now is at the dry blob, 
and superimposed are arrows, the white, which is diverging out of the dry blob into the blue area where it's convecting. So that's what's shown on the far right. If you go to the middle plot, it's the cross section through the dry blob. And it just shows the flow, the, 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 the flow in this plane, which shows that you have the divergent flow out of the dry area and a short return flow into the dry area. So you have this low level circulation, which is developing in the dry areas. If you now take a profile through the dry and the wet areas, what you see is in the dry area, you have a pretty classical boundary layer. So the very right plot is the potential temperature or the density temperature versus height. And you see a fairly well mixed convective boundary layer going to a uniform layer of, a layer of uniform stratification, which is set by the convection itself. In the dry blob, the air is a little bit more dense. It's cooler. Um, and that's because if you look at the radiative fluxes in the dry blob, there's very little water vapor above you, so you're cooling the space very effectively. Um, and you have much more radiative cooling in the boundary layer than you do in the moist regions. So it's the difference between Boulder at night and Louisiana at night. So Louisiana, you're not cooling off very much at night, and Boulder you are, you have a dry atmosphere. And so because of this, you can say, well, maybe that's something we could understand with an even a simpler model. And so this is work with a postdoc on Christine Nauman. And she said, well, how does that actually work? If we just have a convective boundary layer that's sketched here, capped by a small inversion and a layer of uniform stratification above, and we extract energy out of that layer, then to come into balance, we'll have to bring energy back into that layer. So we can do that through increasing surface fluxes, or we can deepen the layer and have more entrainment warming. So we know enough by, about convective boundary layers that we can solve that problem more or less analytically. And then you can ask yourself, well, if you have one layer that's behaving like this with a div given degree of cooling, what if you put it next to another layer where you have more cooling? That's what's happening in those simulations, right? You have a dry blob and you have a moist blob. In the dry blob, you're cooling the boundary layer. In the moist blob, you're not cooling the boundary layer. And if you do that and extract more energy from that boundary layer, what you'll find is that it goes to an equilibrium, which is a bit shallower um, and a bit colder. No surprise. So then if you link the two, what you find is that you get a circulation. And again, you can do all of this analytically. You get a circulation that goes from the dry blob to the moist blob and a slight return flow above, just like we saw in the circulations. So in working that out, there's no real big surprises. But the, 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 the big surprise is when you quantify this and you say, how big, for given differences in radiative cooling between dry and moist areas, how strong are these circulations? So again, you have to stop for a second, get the mental picture. We have a dry area, we have a moist area. The dry area is losing heat to space, um, and that's causing it to cool down, and it's causing a low-level circulation, which is diverging out of the dry area into the moist area. So how important is this radiatively driven circulation? Well, here you can quantify that, and this is the, temp this is the um, boundary layer height here of the moist area in red and the colder dry area in blue. And this is the temperature, of course, the, 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 the moist warm area is warmer and the dry area is cooler. And then you couple them, and this is the flow that emerges between them. And it, as time goes on, it comes into a steady state with a given velocity of about one meter a second. OK, so this is no big deal until you realize that the whole way we think about what drives low-level circulation in the tropics is we think that sea surface temperature gradients from one place in the tropics to another drives low-level circulation, which then organizes convection. But what this shows is that the radiative differences in the boundary layer um, are also very effective in driving low-level circulations. In fact, they're more effective at driving low-level circulations than um, SST gradients alone. And that's important because it shows that how we distribute moisture in the tropics is controlling the low-level circulation, which then determines where, um, um, where uh, helps determine where convection will form. Um, so that's, 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 that's summarized here. Now, before I go on, um, I just want to take a, a spot here and gather your attention again. So what I've shown you a little bit is, is how a very simple model of the atmosphere, radiative convective equilibrium, can be used first to understand something about the climate system, and also to identify some surprising ways in which clouds, convection, water vapor, and radiation interact with each other. 
And understanding these interactions are useful for interpreting much more complicated models. I've also shown how we can use what I call cloud resolving models um, to, to address this idealized problem somewhat more fundamentally. And now I want to tell you about a few things which are happening right now, which I think make the field um, incredibly exciting in terms of where it's going in the future and the things that we can go in the future. And the real exciting thing is that in the past, we only could use these more fundamental cloud resolving models to simulate small domains, idealized problems. But as computers have marched forward, we're breaking through this kilometer barrier. And we're able now to simulate the globe um, at cloud resolving, uh, cloud resolving um, scales. This is, this is types of things that the Japanese have been doing now for about a decade and have really pioneered in the uh, Nikam group, Tomita and, and Sato. Um, but it's becoming practical. Mm -hmm. So it's becoming practical now to have climate models that actually can simulate how heat is transported from the surface into the atmosphere instead of parameterizing it like we've been doing for so long. And as soon as you do that, it, it's, it's amazing how many of the things that we've been trying to solve with convective parameterization just kind of go away. Um, these all sorts of classical problems from the diurnal cycle to stratocumulus, you kind of get for free in these simulations to a large extent. So here we zoom down a little bit to see the structure of the circulation. It's still a global simulation um, now at two and a half kilometers. Um, and what we're going to show now is using the same model how we can zoom into areas and look at the cloud circulation coupling in much more realistic configurations. So we've been doing field work here in Barbados, and we're particularly interested in how these low clouds, which are patterned here in the mesoscale um, through these ribbons, respond to warming. So here you can see Barbados, and you see this dry patch and this moist patch, and you see the, the low clouds develop. And we're getting into finer and finer scales, so here we're going to 300 meters. In a second, we're going to go to 150 meters over still fairly large domains. This is about 20 kilometers, Barbados, so it's um, a few hundred kilometers here along the domain. Um, and here, the output gets hard to write, um, so the time stepping gets a bit sketchy. But you can see the cloud profiles, clouds going up to about two or three kilometers, precipitation falling out of the clouds. The clouds are wearing sombreros. I don't know if you noticed that, but these little kind of anvil-like things from the shallow convection, they look like little sombreros. Those end up being key to understanding how cl clouds respond to warming, being able to quantify these sorts of features. But these are things now that we can simulate on very large scales in ways that are allowed to interact with the circulation um, in ways that we couldn't do before. And I find that to be one of the most exciting things in the field because we're getting a whole new way of looking at old problems. Um, so when before I was complaining about this lens, we look at the, at the future through the lens of parameterized convection. Here we are having a lens that allows us to look at it very differently. And I want to show you just one quick result, which is showing some of the mysteries that emerge from simulations like that. So this was the simulation domain where, where we, we did a, a much more extensive analysis. And here we had a nest which went even finer to um, one kilometer. And we analyzed just this area around our experimental site here in Barbados. So this is a, um, Barbados is there. And this is an area which is about, oh, um, 2,000 kilometers this way and about 650 kilometers north-south. So it's a very large area. Um, and one of the things we were looking at is what controls clouds in this large area and what controls circulation in that large area. And here's the first puzzle, which I'll just put up for you. Is that, is that when we did that, we did it with two things. We did it with a traditional climate model. So we ran the exact same simulations with the traditional climate model. Um, and this is what the vertical velocity field looked like. So this is time in days for uh, the August 2016. This is height in the atmosphere on the, the vertical. And what you see is a bunch of blue and red ribboning, which shows the vertical pressure velocity. Um, having upward and downward motions. So the upward motions are negative omega, so red, and the downward motions are blue. It's, um, sorry, this is December 2013, so it's mostly blue and it's mostly subsiding. And you can look at the variability of the vertical velocity and it looks like this profile. So you tend to see a top-heavy profile with most of the variability in the upper troposphere and fairly little variability in the lower troposphere. 
If you had asked me to draw this picture, that's what the climate model does. If you had asked me to draw this picture, I would have drawn something I think that looks more or less like that because if Kevin Trenberth is here, it's because I read his paper a long time ago and it has a plot that looks like that from climate models. If you do the exact same picture with this very high resolution model, you get something that looks like this. At first glance, it looks the same because the models are being run with an initialization every day. Um, and you see the, the, these sort of convective periods at the beginning of the month, at the end of the month, and the big red blotches in the upper troposphere. That looks the same. But if you look closely, what do you see that's mostly different? You see, in this plot, you see a lot more red here that's extending up through the middle of the troposphere. You see these red things, where here it's just confined to the surface. So you see these deep red excursions. And if you look at the variance of that profile, you get a whole different picture of the tropical atmosphere, where most of the variance is actually at low levels. So this isn't something that we expected. It's not even something that I'm sure is what should happen. Um, there's an indication that it's not unreasonable, which I'll get to in a second. But it's, again, illustrating the power of using different approaches to look at old problems in a whole new way. So in the bottom, what I just showed was the cloud field from those two simulations. We've been struggling for decades trying to get a cloud field in a model of parameterized convection, like ECM, to get a cloud field in this part of the atmosphere, which looks kind of like the cloud field that we get for free when we run the high resolution model. It's beautiful. You just use the laws of physics in a big computer and you turn it on and suddenly you get all of these things that we've been trying so hard and for so long to simulate with parameterized convection. They just begin appearing, but not without their own puzzles, like how much of this is due to a very active circulation in the lower troposphere. So why, um, why might the circulation in the lower troposphere be so variable? Well, one argument is what I just showed you before, is if you resolve the vertical structure of clouds and water vapor, the radiative heating can play a much more active role in driving circulation, as can the microphysical tendencies of condensation in the cloud layer and precipitation in the subcloud layer. So you have a much more interactive coupling between clouds and circulation. Is it right? The other exciting thing is, when we think about clouds and circulation, is that we can now measure clouds and circulation in ways that we never could do before. And so here in the very last part of the talk, I want to show, you know, first I showed you that we can simulate things about cloud and circulation coupling on very large scales in ways that really wasn't practical in the past, but is very much becoming practical. And now I want to make the case that we can actually measure it. So I'm going to tell you about some, an experiment we did in August 2016 called NARVAL-2. And this is the German high-altitude long-range research aircraft. It's a Gulfstream 550. And we have an advanced, we have a little arm station, if you like, um, an advanced um, package of, of remote sensing that sits underneath the aircraft here. Um, and we have a lot of drop sounds that we throw out of the back of the plane. So we had this idea. We, this is Sandrine Boni and myself. We had the idea in, in, in yeah, a couple years ago that maybe we could measure large-scale vertical motion in the atmosphere by doing something very simple, which is just dropping a bunch of sons out of the back of the plane. And as the sons would float down through the atmosphere, the GPS measurements would tell you what the horizontal wind would be. And if you drop the sons around a circle, like one of these yellow circles, which is about 200 kilometers in diameter, if you drop the sons around a circle, what you could then do is integrate the normal wind around the circle and compute the horizontal divergence of the wind. And if you integrated the horizontal divergence of the wind in the vertical, then you could get omega, the large scale velocity. So that was the idea. We've tried this before, not using sons, but using the aircraft winds directly. And that only gives you the divergence at one level. So here, by using the sons, we'd get the whole profile of divergence. And we emailed Minghua Zhang, who's here somewhere, when we had this idea. And we said, Minghua, we want to fly a plane in a circle and drop 12 sons. Do you think it might work? And he said, yeah. So we said, okay, then we'll do it. So we got a, you know, a few hundred thousand euro together and, and, and a lot more for the plane. And we went out and we threw the sons in a circle. But the, the thing that we did, which was special, doesn't sound very special, right? Just throwing sons out of the back of a plane. But the thing that we did was special was we had the idea that, you know, we'll throw the sons out, they'll measure the divergence, we'll get an answer. But how do you know if the answer is meaningful? Right? You get divergence, you integrate it, you get a wiggle. But is that wiggle telling you anything about the atmosphere? So our only idea was to do it twice. So we'd fly a circle, and then we'd fly another circle. 
And um, then we'd go somewhere else and we'd fly a circle and we'd fly another circle. And then we would compare the horizontal divergence measured around one circle with a circle flown an hour later in the same air mass. Um, so that's illustrated here. This is the actual flight track. These are the actual sun drops from the first circle. We turned around, flew the other way around. We had the other circle. And then we can compare the divergence measurements from those sons. So if the flow is stationary, well, if the flow is not stationary, they won't agree and you're, you're sunk. But if it's not stationary on the time scale of an hour, it's not really meaningful, the 200 kilometer divergence. But if the flow is stationary on the time scale of hours, the only way the answer could agree is if you're actually measuring something physical. I haven't thought of another way that nature could trick us and make the answer agree. So what do we get? Here's the two pairs of circles, the um, upper circle, a pair, of, uh, you know, a pair of circles in the bottom yellow, another pair of circles, so circle one and circle two, circle three and circle four. And in the red, you see circle one and circle two. And what you can see here is two thin lines. And those two thin lines are telling you the divergence measured by each set of sons. They, 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 they follow each other in every little wiggle. And if you actually use all 24 sons, then you get the thickened line. And you can estimate the uncertainty statistically, given that you have 24 sons, which are, um, in a way, oversampling. You can estimate the uncertainty. And the uncertainty that you estimate is consistent with the differences among the circles. So the point is, you can measure now with a single aircraft, you can measure the large scale divergence in the tropical atmosphere on scales which are very large, 200 kilometers. The other thing, if you look closely, this is circle three and circle four in the blue. We did it again, and it agrees again. And if you look really closely in circle one and circle two, there's no clouds in that circle. If you were in the plane, which I was, and you look down, you would see these little tiny puffy clouds, a few hundred meters just straggling along the top of the subcloud layer, but, but hardly anything. Whereas here, it's harder to see, but you see a lot of white. There were heaps of clouds that went up to about three kilometers in this circle. When you look at the low level flow, you see in this one it's divergent, and in this one it's convergent at low levels, very consistent with the patterning of the clouds. So for the first time now, we're able to measure the large-scale environment on a time scale of, of, of hours in which the clouds are embedded, giving us the hope that we can actually measure this cloud circulation coupling that's causing all sorts of problems, like I said in the first part of the talk. We did this on several days and on several flights, all together, five pairs of circles. And here's, here's the result. You have five profiles, one, two, three, four, five, from left to right. In the upper is the divergence. The gray band is the 5 to 95% uncertainty from the regressed winds. I show how here we just combine the circles to get the best estimate of the winds once we convinced ourselves it works. And it shows you how well you can measure the divergence. And below is if you integrate the divergence upward, it's the vertical velocity. So the surprise here is if you know something about the tropics, normally when we think about the tropics, we think of subsidence, the vertical motion away from clouds and subsiding areas, as balancing what? So normally if you're in the tropics and you're in the clear sky, you think of the subsidence, the downwelling atmosphere, as balancing radiative cooling. So if you know the radiative cooling and you divide by the lapse rate, you should get the radiatively driven subsidence. Does anybody know what that number is offhand? You have to think about it for a sec. So it's about 20 hectopascals per day. That's the radiatively driven substance rate. But what you see here is the scale of this is 200, and we routinely get estimates of the subsidence on these scales, which is more like a factor of five larger than the radiatively driven subsidence. So this gives us a hint that maybe the model that we're looking at um, isn't also wacky in producing a lot of variability in the lower troposphere. The other thing you could do is, um, what was that? Was that Sesame Street where they had this thing as one of these things don't look like the other or something like that? I think it was Sesame Street for the people. I know it's, a, it's an international audience and not everybody grew up watching Sesame Street, but they had this thing where they would show you things that look the same. One of these things does not look like the other, right? You see which one I mean? The one that's different is this one here on the right. And here you see convergence going through a deep layer getting up to six kilometers. The difference between this flight and all of these flights was this one we went across the ITCZ. So our circle went around this finger of a convergence line at the edge of the ITCZ. And all of the other four plots were in areas of shallow convection. So again, it makes sense. 
So the exciting thing is that now we can measure vertical motion, something we never could do. And we can link that to how clouds behave. And we can simulate it. So this is setting the stage for an experiment that I'm really super excited about. It's called Eureka. And we're going to try to bring these things together with two aircraft. So this is hollow, which will fly high. Um, and so this is a large German component. Um, this is together with many German universities, our institute, um, the, the German um, the DLR, the, 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 the Space Center. And here we will fly hollow high with this huge array of remote sensing looking down, mapping out the clouds, and mapping out the large-scale environment. And at the same time, we'll fly the French ATR aircraft with its suite of remote sensing low, measuring the clouds. So we're able to go now, you know, we have these problems. We don't understand how convection works. We know it's important. We don't know how it couples to the large scales. But we have this possibility now to actually simulate it more fundamentally with high resolution, large domain models. And we can actually measure it. And we're going to do both in the context of Eureka. We're going to measure the large scale environment. We're going to measure the macroscopic properties of clouds and see if we can understand the relationship between the two. And if we can, if that relationship is the same as the relationships that kind of emerge for free, so to speak, lots of flops, but for free in the large scale modeling. So here I would um, come to my penultimate slide, which is um, sometimes I like to read the slide and I can't see that angle, so I have to look at the screen here. Um, so in the tropics, clouds, convection, and circulation are strongly coupled. It's almost the definition of the deep tropics. And this coupling is poorly understood but it really determines important properties of the tropical atmosphere. I tried to show you that through those um, simple examples. I tried to show you how those simple examples extend to broader scale phenomena in more or less idealized context. Um, I tried to make the case that new modeling techniques make it now possible to resolve the vertical heat transport on large, even global domains, allowing a more natural coupling among clouds, convection, and circulation. And I tried to show you how new observational techniques, very simple things, um, have been developed that now make it possible to observationally look at the coupling between clouds and convection. And I think, and I will maintain, that this, 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 th th these approaches, this ability to simulate things that we couldn't simulate before, and this ability to observe things that we couldn't observe before, is changing the way we think about the field. So as far as I'm concerned, I can't get out of the past quickly enough and the past is the way we've been approaching climate science with heavily parameterized comprehensive models and go into this lean mean world of a few equations with lots of computing power to actually simulate how heat transport works and new observational capacities with you know wonderful aircraft and, and, and satellite measurements to try to bring these things together on the same scale this, this other aspect of this complementarity is that when we simulate on a two kilometer scale and you ask the people who develop the microwave radiometers or the radars or the water vapor lidars to fly along with you, they look at the simulations and they look at what they're observing and they're the same scales. People get excited. And so I've never seen anything that brings the community together so powerfully. Try to get an observationalist interested in a cumulus parameterization. I mean, it's made up of things you can't observe that we know don't work. Um, and you're only looking at the end result. So this, this to me really is one of the most exciting things that's happening in the field. And it's, it's really fun to be a part of it. And the only thing that makes it more fun is that there's so many cool people who are working on these problems. Um, and I wanted to point out um, nine of them who are here because I drew on, I, I've worked to different degrees with many of them. But some who I haven't worked with, like Ali Wing, who's somewhere in the audience here, um, or Carolyn Miller, um, have also done work which disproportionately um, influenced my thinking. So if, if there's anything that you didn't like about my talk, I'm sure it was Alison Wing's fault. Thank you very much. <laughs> so much, Bjorn. I want to present you with a plaque for your delivery of this uh, lecture. And uh, you can take any answers, uh, questions. Could you please come up to the mics to, uh, so that everybody can hear the questions? Go ahead. Thank you. Yeah. Hi, 
You are? Oh, mic doesn't work. Oh. Hmm. I can repeat the question if you want. So. Do you want to say it loud and I'll repeat? Sure. Uh, I love the divergence, of course. And um, I'm wondering if it's uh, adiabatic divergence, part of a low frequency gravity wave uh, field. Or it's maybe is diabetic divergence. Did you calculate the rate of cooling from your actual drop zones, actual vapor profiles, and maybe that's not your generic 10 or 20 millibars per hour, but it's uh, maybe maybe those. Uh, split. So, are, is there a heating profile structure that's as, as detailed as the vertical velocity profile structure? Um, so, Brian asked if 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 maybe this uh, these uh, very strong. Um, pattern of divergence and convergence that we're measuring could be explained by actually the heating rate profile. And we haven't calculated the heating rate profile, but if you look at the temperature and moisture profiles, they don't make me think that that's happening. I'm, I, I much more believe in the, the, you know, sort of your view of lots of, lots of stones in the pond, so you're seeing remote heating causing gravity waves. And if you look at the vertical structure of the pro those profiles, the wavelength is about two kilometers, which would, in the vertical, which would correspond to sort of a, a prime heating mode, which is about a kilometer, which is sort of the depth of the subcloud layer, the depth of the clouds that they have to be before they start precipitating. So I'm betting on the gravity wave argument, but we're trying to do the calculations now to try to see if we can just, in a, in a linear model, reproduce that structure for imposed heating and, and see if it looks like that. Kevin. So Kevin said um, he hated my talk, but um, <laughs> no, that, that part I changed. But he, he, he asked about these idealized problems and to what extent we can bring in other components of the Earth system to understand something about, um, about how that works. And Tim Cronin, who might be around, has done some very nice work in looking at land-sea circulations in terms of um, putting an island and looking at how that behaves. Um, we've been doing some work at the MPI where we look at uh, radiative convective equilibrium, and Pierre Gentin, also at Columbia, with um, Nicola Rochetan has done this, where you look at radiative convective equilibrium over land. And the interesting that we, thing that we find over land is that if you do RCE over land, then the convection aggregates in one spot. And it will stay aggregated until you dry out the land enough, um, basically you have to get to the wilting point, that you create enough surface temperature gradients to cause these low level circulations that move the convection um, um, to the dry areas. So, so, once you, so I do think there's ways to use these idealized problems. The monsoon is a large scale problem in and of itself, so I think that one would be a bit trickier. Um, but certainly land atmospheric interactions you can see but every time we do this, the thing I come back and back and back to is how important these lower tropospheric circulations seem to be for understanding where convection forms, how it organizes, how it moves, um, and how diabatically forced these are, whether it's remotely or, or locally. Um, so yes, I think we can use these idealized approaches, and that's what we've done so far. So Bruce. Quick. Yeah, so for these experiments, now what we can do with these experiments, when we, when we flew in Narval 2, we ran the model at, you know, at one kilometer, and we're zooming in around the flight area at 100 meters, and these are initialized. So we, we start at 0z, the flights are about 12 hours later, and so there's a lot of, and they initialize fairly well, so we've actually compared the vertical velocity profiles from the model with the simulations, and it's actually amazing how well they agree in, in, in many cases, especially when the analysis on the large scale looks like what we are observing. So we can, we can compare because we work within that time window. Um, and on the more the statistics of it, we're, we're working through those problems. So now we have, we started one of the very first intercomparison projects where we're trying to take um, 
five or six global cloud resolving models and use those for a month, 40 days and 40 nights of simulations to actually see what's common and what's not common in those simulations. But yeah, it's all work in progress. I want to thank uh, Bjorn again with uh, some hand claps and uh, we'll see you at the next session.